<laughs> Come on in. Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Dharma Yarns. And this is a little group that meets the first Wednesday of every month. And my name's Sandra Henville, and I'm going to be giving the talk tonight. Normally I'd have a friend to introduce me, but everyone's either got transport hassles or they're home with COVID isolating. So I'm a one woman band tonight. <laughs> but I do have some lovely friends in the audience to help me out. So we, we, what do we mean by having a yarn? So to have a yarn, it's a bit of an old Australian term and what it basically means is to have a good chat about something. And it's a, it's a two-way process. So it's having a good dialogue, which sort of fits with the Buddhist theme because you know that a lot of the early teachings of the Buddha, they, they, they were verbal. Nothing was written down for quite some time. And so the, the stories that were passed on till eventually, a um, long time later, I think it was either the Sri Lankans or the Indians that started to record the suttas. So it's a pretty special format. So I'd like to try and, I don't know, not emulate, but <laughs> Just have a yarn. <laughs> so, I think tonight we'll start with the meditation because it's just a lovely way of settling ourselves into this beautiful space. And I've been um, sharing this book with my workmates, Happiness Through Meditation. It's one of Arjun Brahm's books. It used to be known as Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. And I think this must be a reprint for the American audience because I see quite a few American references in there. So there's a little meditation in there that's, um, it gives lots of advice for how to overcome this struggle in our meditation practice. And it gives a little um, analogy of having a gatekeeper and I was reminded of years ago when I worked in Melbourne and I had an Iraqi friend, Khalid. And Khalid had been forced to flee Iraq. So he was there as the country was going into total disarray. And he tells the story that there were three aeroplanes. And they said, that one's going to Canada, that one's going to the US, that's going to Australia run for the one you want. And you ended up on the one to Australia. And, you know, it must have been quite a cultural shock for him. And I, we used to do a lot of work um, surveying forest birds in the Victorian forest. And we're driving up to, I can't remember what it's called, the forest that we used to go to. And he says, Sandra, I saw something that I never expected to see in Australia. Never in my dreams did I expect to see this thing. And I said, good grief, what is it? And he said, I saw a gate station, like a sentry station. And I said, oh, that's a bit unusual. You sure you just didn't see an old outback dunny in the paddock? <laughs> and then anyway, we came across the sentry station and what it was, it's a, it was a little um, hut. And if you grew up in the country, you'll totally relate to this. So I grew up in Narragin and I used to catch a school bus every morning and my dad built us this little shed so we could stand in the shed and keep dry while the school bus came and collected us. So it wasn't a century. <laughs> it wasn't like a... Um, a, like a, a a, a army checkpoint. <laughs> it was the school bus shed. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was quite interesting. So I'd like to guide us through this meditation and we're going to refer to this notion of a gatekeeper 
And maybe, maybe we imagine we're waiting for the school bus. <laughs> we'll call it the peace train. Ajahn Brahm uses the analogy of Buddha air, but we'll have the peace train. <laughs> I know Cat Stevens wrote that wonderful song, but he wasn't the original author. So if anyone remembers, now's your chance to <laughs> win the trivia prize. So let's, let's settle down together. And as always, the most important thing about meditation is to be kind and compassionate to yourself. That's the most important thing. So I'm going to close this computer and open it up at the end. And I'd invite you to just sit comfortably. And in your own time, gently close down the eyes and allow yourself to come into the space. This is a beautiful space. And maybe, you know, meditation's often part intent, part imagination. So you might want to even imagine that you're sitting at the school bus ship. <laughs> and what we're going to do to start off is we're going to invite our gatekeeper for a bit of a chat. And we're going to ask Give them a few instructions. It's kind of like setting an intent, intent. So we're going to just set some parameters around who's allowed in and who's allowed out. Who can jump on the peace train with us and who has to stay at the station. And to help us along, we're going to ask our gatekeeper, maybe it's our train conductor, our peace train conductor, to help us. And we say, help me be aware of the present moment. Help me not to go off into the past or into the future. But just be here in this beautiful space of presence. And we might choose our own words is gently guiding ourselves. May I be here. In presence. I will not wander off into the past. I'll not be dragged into the future. I come into this present moment. Come into peace. in my own comfortable seat on this peace train. As 
So feeling the sense of calm, sense of stillness. No past, no future, just coming into now. It's all there is now. We ask our conductor, our internal gatekeeper, to help us as we say, I'll be silently aware in this present moment. I choose to discard all inner speech, all the tales of the past the melancholia, the wistful thinking, the stories on repeat. And I equally discard all the inner speech, all the aversions, the desires, that drag me into the future. And rest in the silence of its present moment. Knowing that I'm sitting knowing that I'm breathing. Relaxing into peace. Letting all the sounds, all the forms of the world pass by me. like rolling countryside. And I feel light, like the sun of a beautiful day. Totally at peace. totally aware of the breath in this present moment, discarding all other perceptions and thoughts. Sitting in the here and now with my beautiful breath, my whole breath, enjoying its rhythm, letting everything else go.
my breath, my faithful, kind, gentle gatekeeper. And as you ride along on this peace train, if you get bored with peace, go deeper. And if you find yourself still holding on, let go.
We are starting to get close to our next station, Samadhi. And what I'd invite you to do is feel into your place of peace. Feel into the stillness, the sense of calm. And ask yourself, what is the cause of these feelings of peace? What are the conditions that give rise to peace? How do I value peace? Doors opening, mind the gap. <laughs> uh, tonight I wanted to have a bit of a yarn about something interesting I've noticed amongst my various meditation classes. So I, I guide a number of classes during the week and have a few different interests with the Buddhist Society, one of them being chairing the spiritual education group, um, the KFC, the Kalyana Friendship Community, Dharma Yarns, uh, my work, and Perth Mindfulness Meditation Group, small group of friends. And one thing I've noticed over the years is that a lot of people really struggle with their practice. And it's, it bewilders me. I mean, I was up at Dharmasara a few weekends ago now. And there was a young couple there. And one of them had just come off a long retreat. And he was hobbling around and he'd done himself an injury. He'd blown out his knees. And I thought, my goodness, I don't think the Buddha ever intended for that. You know, why? Why are we so earnest? So tonight I'd like to explore the problem with being earnest. And it's a bit of a study into a term, a Buddhist term, apamada. So... The importance of being earnest, I'm sure many of you have seen the stage play or seen it on TV. I think it was on iView recently. So that's ABC or Auntie. And the importance of being earnest is one of Oscar Wilde's best loved plays. It's a pretty silly set of affairs set in 1895 England. Nonetheless, people love it. And it's a firm favourite amongst many amateur theatre groups. It's full of stuff and nonsense and pokes fun at Victorian society, reducing their privilege 
to an, an absurd level of drama. Now to be earnest is generally understood as being diligent, careful and above all sincere. And to a large extent the characters in the importance of being earnest, they do deliver on, on earnestness. I mean, you could say that the characters are very earnest in this play. The main protagonist, Jack, is indeed diligent and careful to perpetuate the existence of a double life. He's always worrying about his fictional younger brother, Ernest, who is living in Albany. Or is that living it up in Libertine London? And his good friend, Algernon, too, he isn't adverse to a spot of bumbering to avoid being overburdened with social duties. So both of these men go to great lengths and are incredibly earnest and dedicated to perpetuating the illusion of being moral and productive members of society. They're quite the pair of actors. And as for the ladies, there's a character, Gwendolyn, who declares, the only safe name for a husband is Ernest. I pity any woman whose husband is not called Ernest. I mean, it's very serious. Because, and you know, well, after all, Ernest implies diligence and trustworthiness, and it's a fine trait in a life partner. Jack, being the ever obliging man he is, readily agrees to change his name to Ernest to win her love. And we trundle along through the infamous handbag scandal because Jack was found at a train station in a handbag. Very scandalous. And subsequently, he falls and then he has a redemption of sorts. And it turns out he was a legitimate earnest all along. And the play just spirals into this parody. It's, it's quite hilarious. You should look it up on iView. But Oscar Wilde never claimed there was any social or moral message being made in his play. In fact, he said that it was superficially about nothing at all. The theme was that we should treat all trivial things in life very seriously and all serious things in life with a sincere and studied triviality. Now what on earth has that got to do with meditation? Well, as meditators, put simply, we too are often subject to delusions of earnestness. We tie ourselves in knots, thinking that we should be a certain way. Sometimes we even think we should be different people. We long for approval and to feel worthy. But who are we seeking approval from? Approval from the Buddha? Approval from our parents, our teachers, our partners, ourselves? We are constantly striving to earn our worthiness. And as I was saying earlier, I've I've been amazed teaching meditation over the years, just how many people struggle unnecessarily with a misplaced earnestness, constantly creating and refining their story, throwing themselves to all manner of spiritual retreat and pursuits. And eventually, they even undertake their first long retreat only to strive and struggle. It's as though they approach this opportunity to know peace with such expectation and, dare I say it, importance, only to treat it as a sense of penance. Now, I've met them with their injured knees, hobbling along, grimacing, but proud of the achievement of having endured. They process some stuff. They really earned it. And along the way, Maybe they enjoyed a brief glimpse of a spiritual high or what it means to be at peace. It's not all bad. I ask them, how did you go? Good, bad, indifferent? 
you know, there's something not quite right with this scene. Sitting through pain, and this is something that Ajahn Brahmali taught us recently in the Satipatthana workshop series. Sitting through pain is suffering. And the whole point of our practice is about giving up the hindrances. Or as it is so beautifully put in the Pariya Yasutta, the one called Is There a Way? Or the, it's, it's about giving up the corruptions of the heart. I love that term. So focusing on the bodily sensations as feeling of fe and feelings as described in the Satipatthana Sutta, which is the base, for, base of mindfulness meditation, to Satipatthana Sutta and the Anapana Sutta, if you're looking for real, clear instructions on the practice. It doesn't actually prescribe sitting through pain. So when they talk about Vedana, the feeling sensations, it's not about sitting there grimacing. It's not about, you know, suffering through pain to earn peace. That was, that was never the intent. But it's amazing how many people get confused on that. It's like, yeah, it's extraordinary. And it doesn't infer processing either. You know, we're not going there to work stuff out. It's about letting go. And it certainly doesn't prescribe a regimen of endurance or any form of pact in exchange for a calm and clear mind. The irony is that to approach the meditation practice in this way is actually a form of delusion. Because the Satipatthana Sutta teaches us that to cultivate peace is the way to know the absence of suffering. So, in a way, it's this constant process of attrition. You recognize something to let go of that. So we recognize peace, stillness, that beautiful, peaceful energy that hopefully we all got a glimpse of in the meditation. We understand that in order to know the absence of suffering. And you know the other irony is that the Sutta doesn't even make any inference that we should be meditating all the time. It doesn't actually call for hours and hours of meditation. And I think that's why when you go on retreat with Arjun Brahm, he makes it abundantly clear. And he says, chillax. You know, if you come on retreat and you need to sleep for two days, just sleep. Because what will happen, it, was, it will make you a better meditator. And you'll probably have a wonderful experience. But if you come along, you're like, right, I'm going to do mindfulness, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to drop in now. Never works. It's about being kind, being compassionate. It's the most important thing. And that's why I always start the meditations with the most important thing is to be kind and compassionate to yourself. So we've got to sort of realise that mindfulness is a long game. And it's, as Ajahn Brahmali says, it's part of a gradual training, quite a gentle training. That's why it's number seven on the Eightfold Path. And it's also why it's the very first of the awakening factors. So it's well before rapture, tranquility and immersion. But to get there requires walking a path of right understanding, thought, speech, action, livelihood and effort. It's the small light on the hill. 
The best we can do is simply sit and ask ourselves whether our lived experience is kind, is it gentle, is it peaceful. So our tendencies are towards craving. And when you look deeply at it, it includes a craving to no longer be separated from peace. But we naturally prefer a quick fix. And it's no wonder we find ourselves inundated with hashtags like radical compassion and self-care. And as part of mental health training course, I was introduced to the work of a famed writer and activist, Audre Lorde. You might have heard, for, heard of her. And she had this statement, caring for myself is no self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Fairly heavy going. And as Buddhists, we know that's but a siren call. And it just, all it does is serve to bring us to a state where we're more and more attached to ourselves and we employ ever more earnest efforts to feel worthy. And it reminds me of a study I read, because um, I do a lot of research to prepare these talks. And there was a study in the US amongst college students, and they were looking at the um, relationship between self-esteem and the ability to forgive. And it was just fascinating, because what they, what they came across is that those students who had this strong self-esteem and this strong drive, like, you know, they, they were, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with self-care, I mean, we, we should care for ourselves, but it sort of forced, like, forced this notion of self that was so strong that their propensity to be able to forgive was lessened. So it was driving the individualism and in some way serving to make them less kind, less compassionate, less forgiving. So I thought that, that was an interesting paradox. So perversely, it can only serve to take us further away from true and lasting peace further away from the teachings of right understanding, further away from the Dharma. And it's this kind of despair that leads people to turn to all sorts of answers, both spiritual and secular. And I recently came across this dialogue with Nick Cave for his website, The Red Hand Files. It's worth a read. And then John from Brooklyn Posts, Nick, how or when do you shut the voices of all your influences, your heroes, your parents, your Jesus, your music, to listen to yourself, to become you, or to believe that what you create is your own? And Nick replies, right alongside a picture of Apollo's chariot, quite a famous painting, Apollo being the Greek god of sun and light and truth and prophecy and poetry and a whole range of artistic and healing forces. And he says, Dear John, nothing you create is ultimately your own, yet all of it is you. Your imagination, it seems to me, is mostly an accidental dance between collected memory and influence. And it's not intrinsic to you. Rather, it is a construction that awaits spiritual ignition. In my view, John, worry less about what you make. That will mostly look after itself and is to some extent beyond your control. Perhaps it's even none of your business. And devote yourself to nourishing this animating spirit. Apply yourself fully to the task. Let go of the outcome and your true voice will appear. You'll see, it can be no other way. 
And you know, there might well be some truth in this, but there's also an enticing fiction. We do need to understand this animating spirit on some level. After all, it's the fuel that drives our hindrances and prevents us getting closer to our peace, to samadhi. We know that as meditators when we look at the candles. Understanding the hindrances allows us to contemplate the insights into the difference between the moment to moment experience and all the mental project projections for candors we pile onto our human experience. And the Buddha himself explained the limitations of our experience quite clearly when he was talking to the god Rohitasa. There's all sorts of wonderful things you can find in the suttas. This is quite a famous line, and he says, For it is in this fathom long carcass with its perceptions and mind that I describe the world, its origin, its cessation, and the practice that leads to its cessation. So, back to Oscar Wilde for a second. He has a point when he says the problem lies in taking trivial things in life too seriously and instead we should take the serious things in life with a sincere and studied triviality. And I think what this means is that we don't let ourselves descend to the absurd to the point where we just hang on to those things that no longer serve us. We know that desire and aversion only pull us into the future our melancholy only keeps us in the past. It's this constant dance. And I think one of the funniest things in the play is when Lady Bracknell says to Jack, My nephew, you seem to be showing signs of triviality. And Jack replies, On the contrary, I've now understood for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs> so all in all, like Jack and his Victorian cronies, we gradually begin to realise the fallibilities of being earnest. So it appears we need to go back to the start with a view to understanding the Buddha's last words before his extinguishment. And to do this, we need to reacquaint ourselves with the early Buddhist texts and the teachings around Apamada. So Apamada is a Pali term which features in the Buddha's last words in the Parinibbana Sutta. So the Buddha reached enlightenment and then he lived on for 45 years until his final death, his Parinibbana, his extinguishment. And some say that this word, apamada, summarises all the advice the Buddha had given in his 45 years of existence. It's quite the call. And look, there are so many words the Buddha could have said in the final hours before his extinguishment. I mean, it's quite funny to read some of the suttas. I mean, he... He actually got terrible food poisoning before he died. I mean, he could have said, because, beware the pork curry, or because the villagers have mixed up the mushrooms. There's a whole host of things he could have said. <laughs> I mean, he did take the time to sort out his charioteer. He seemed to be a bit of a... Um, bit of a rascal. So he did, he did take care of a few things. And the, um, the Parinibbana Sutta is quite a long one. Ajahn Brahmali has about 16 chapters of it. <laughs> hours and hours. But what he said was this, and I'll read it in Pali, and I'll try and get it right. <laughs> Handa dani bikoa amantayami Whoa. 
Vayadama Sankara Apamadena Sampadita Ti. Say what? But notice the term Apamadena right there next to Sankara. And as always with the EBTs, it's easy to get confused, so we need to unpick it a bit to understand it clearly. And this is where the problems with earnestness start to arise. And we become aware of the power of our own conditioning. Now the Buddha always taught us to draw our own conclusions when listening to his teachings. So some of you might remember or be familiar with the Kalama Sutta. Um, Look that one up. But consider this interpretation by the late sister Vajira and Francis Story. And you can download this from the Theravadan Buddhist website, Access to Insight. It's quite a, um, it's quite a piece of, oh, I'm going to be controversial. It feels like a wonderful piece of maybe factual historical fiction. And anyway, the way, the way they translate it as, is like this. Behold now, because I exhort you, all compounded things are subject to vanish. Strive with earnestness. But as Ajahn Brahmali always reminds us, it pays to read widely so as not to let the limitations of our knowledge stand in the way of getting to the truth. And not to cast nasturtions, but Sister Vajira lived a rather tumultuous life. It would offer a good screenplay and was well acquainted with suffering and spiritual struggles. And I just feel the striving inherent, inherent in that translation. Feels a bit loaded. And I, so I kept reading and I came across Asanga, the fourth century Indian scholar and one of the most important spiritual figures in Mahayana Buddhism. And he describes Epamada as being a product of caring with this translation, to energetically cherish the good and guard the mind against what gives rise to affliction. So it's starting to bring us closer, it feels a bit kinder. Now Bhikkhu Sujato, who you can find on Sutta Sentra, offers a much softer and concise translation. He says, the translation is, come now medicants, I say to you all, conditions fall apart, persist with diligence. And he offers several synonyms diligence, thoughtfulness, carefulness, conscientiousness, watchfulness, vigilance, sort of a more softer measure of earnestness and zeal. And Ajahn Brahmali reminds us to look back at the root words. So Pamada translates as heedlessness. So if you take all of this into consideration, what the Buddha may well have been asking us was to take care of our own salvation, our own welfare, to not allow our mindfulness to lapse. So in the simplest form, it's about being kind to ourselves as we walk this path. And the Buddha gets really quite lyrical about Apamada, espousing its virtues. It is the most precious of the heartwoods, akin to the red sandalwood, the sweetest smelling of the flowers, the jasmine, the joy of the sunshine after the winter rains, the oceans that receive the great rivers, the prized ointment of the perfumed Himalayan spikenard root, above all, the most skillful of qualities. 
spikenard is actually a form of valerian which is used to um, help people feel calm and helps with sleep so I found that quite interesting but I think this recording um, from the Itiwataka, the Buddhist sayings, the section of the ones, this translation by John Ireland that resonates with me most. And the Buddha said, there's one thing because developed and continually practiced by which both kinds of welfare acquired, are acquired and maintained. Welfare in the here and now and that pertaining to the future. What is that one thing? It is diligence in wholesome states. That is the one thing. The wise praise diligence in doing deeds of merit. For one who is wise and diligent obtains a twofold benefit. Welfare in the here and now and welfare in a future life. And because one is realized for good, the wise person is called a sage. So now that we've uncovered the problems with being earnest, what does that mean for us as meditators? If the Buddha says that diligence is the way to ensure our own welfare and it's an inherently kind practice, why do we struggle so much and lose faith? And maybe the devas have the answer this rather sweet teaching on faith from the Samyutta Nikaya. On this occasion the Buddha was dwelling in Jita's Grove, one of his favourites, and was approached by a beautiful congregation of devas who are like angels, heavenly beings. And they recited this voice, foolish people devoid of wisdom devote themselves to negligence. But the wise man guards diligence as his foremost treasure. Do not yield to negligence. Don't be intimate with sensual delight. For the diligent ones meditating attain supreme happiness. It's quite beautiful. And again, when I think of it, it all comes back to how we value peace. It's always worth asking yourself that. And I always love it, and it's why I borrowed it. I love it when Arjun Brown says in his meditations, when you get bored of peace, go deeper. It does feel like coming home. And I'd like to leave the last word with um, the American novelist, poet, essayist, environmental activist, Wendell Berry from his essay, The Unforeseen Wilderness. And he says, and the world cannot be discovered by a journey of miles, no matter how long, but only by a spiritual journey, a journey of one inch, very arduous and humbling and joyful, by which we arrive at the ground of our own feet and learn to be at home. So it's like to close on that peaceful note. But for a bit of a chuckle, I'll finish by rounding back to the importance or the problem with being earnest. And the clangor in the play must go to Jack, the clangor award, who's now known as Ernest John, because after being after Miss Prism, the, the ditzy housekeeper, had accidentally mixed up Jack as a baby with the three-chapter novel and left Jack in a handbag at the train station. And he was later adopted by someone else. He later finds out that he's actually, his birth name is Ernest John. And he says to Gwendolyn, who's the object of his ardour, his affection, Gwendolyn, It is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly he has been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? To which Gwendolyn replies, I can, for I feel you are sure to change. (laughs) 
And therein lies the paradox of being earnest. <laughs> so that was a bit of a bit of a romp through the the importance or the problem or the paradox of being earnest. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I'm gonna have a little peek at the at the um chat. Oh gosh. And I'll just share with you what's being written here and also ask you if you've got any questions and anything you'd like to have a yarn about that came up in the in the meditation or in the in the talk, the, the foray into earnestness. Because yeah, lots of people really do struggle with their practice. You know, if it was that easy, we'd all be arahants. And I don't think anyone's parents are arahants. So, yeah. So, any questions? Delusia is at the ready with the microphone. Oh, shall we see what our chat friends have said? <laughs> Mike says the speaker is right. We tend to try to force ourselves into a perfect mould. It only makes things worse. Too true. <laughs> exactly. Meditation with a mindset of excitement makes a huge difference. Not putting ourselves through a mental boot camp. And I know some people really do treat it as a mental boot camp, and it's so not. Um, what else have we got? Suffering equals expectations minus reality. Got people from Poland all over the place. And only one question. <laughs> what now I think I think we all need to help with the answer to this one. What should I do if life does not allow me to be kind to myself? I wish that person was here so we could ask for a bit more explanation of that. But why would it be that life does not allow oneself to be kind to themselves? Any ideas? Why? 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 Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm just trying to think to how to even address that. And it, there's one, one saying that I love. It's from the Sagadara. And it says, and he was asked, you know, Something like, what's the secret to how you lived your life? You know, what, what, what was it that you learned during your life? And he said, love tells me I am everything. Wisdom tells me I am nothing. Between these two, my life flows. So maybe it's as we were saying earlier, it's understanding that difference between that moment-to-moment -moment awareness and the, all the expectations we heap upon ourselves. And if we could only, you know, find that peace, then we, we, we know we can be kind to ourselves. Let's get the mic to you because you've got a wonderful point for this yarn. I'm just thinking that on one side there is earnestness and on the other side there is letting go. And mm. in earnestness there is almost an impossibility to let go. It's almost the opposite. And the invitation yeah. to... Uh, 
the life is to let go. It becomes a delusion, doesn't it? And that delusion is pretty hard to see. I remember, I think it was Rupert Spira I was listening to, and he was talking to someone about depression, and he likened it to being like a, um, like a dark cloud. So if we think of the, the sun, the sun's always shining. Or if you think of a movie projected, there's always a light screening, maybe the importance of being earnest, screening the film. And in between that projector and the light and the screen, there's a film of darkness, like a cloud. But it's just that. It's not a permanent fixture. The light is always there. So I guess it's, it's about you know, trying to, not trying, because trying is striving, but just letting go. You know, coming into that, that stillness, that peace. And gradually, when you make a habit of coming into peace, or habit of remembering peace, remembering that you're not separated from peace, because there's a lot of guilt in that separation. But once we let go of that guilt, come into peace, you know, we, we, we can be kind. It's, yeah, we you know, take care of your own salvation, your own welfare. And um, Ron, you must have been reading this um, person's mind. He's saying here, yeah, Ajahn Chah advised his monks to endure. How do we harmonize endurance with gentleness? I think that's what we were just discussing. The person who is struggling to find kindness, it's basically about poverty and basic needs not being met. Shelter, water, food. Mm. Yeah. There's some pretty dark stuff coming in on the chat now. I think I'll leave it there. Well, exercise my choice. <laughs> So I'd like to thank everybody for coming along this evening. And it's wonderful to meditate with you all. And Ron has prepared, as he always does, a lovely spread over in the kitchen. So I'd like to invite you all for tea and snacks and chat and we'll continue to continue to yarn there. And we'll be yeah, we'll be continuing this series the first Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. And in between, just keep an eye on the BSWA website because there's so much happening. So second and fourth Saturday, I look after the Kalyana Friendship Community. Kalyana Mitta, meaning spiritual friends. We come together and... Um, it's quite funny, Ajahn Brahm coined the term KFC. So every second and fourth Saturday, we bring the monks, the nuns in for a frying, and we ask them questions. <laughs> now we have a bit of a yarn and they lead us for a meditation and it's all good fun. <laughs> so come along. Um, if you're under 35, the first and third Saturday is for the Be Quiet gr group group of young meditators and um, yeah stuff happening all the time just look it up so we'll pay our respects and we shall migrate to the tea room thank you everybody